Welcome to the Church of St. Matthew the Apostle at Worcester, where we celebrate the 11th Sunday after Pentecost, the 20th Sunday in Ordinary Time, welcoming Canon Richard Simpson as preacher today. Good morning. Good morning to all on this Sunday morning, August 16th, the 11th Sunday after Pentecost, the 20th Sunday in Ordinary Time. We thank Don and our beautiful organ for getting us off to a great start, recalling something so important for us to always keep in mind. There is indeed a wideness in God's mercy, and we, receiving that mercy, are called upon to pass on that wideness, to allow over a lifetime our own hearts to continually broaden, that we might be gentle and loving always with one another. And so, on this Lord's Day, let us pray together. Blessed be our Lord, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks. We praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, 
in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have given your only Son to be for us a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life. Give us grace to receive thankfully the fruits of his redeeming work and to follow daily in the blessed steps of his most holy life through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our lessons today are offered to us and for us by Harris and Elisa Gaylor. Thank you, ladies, for reading for us for the first time from the book of Genesis and from the letter of Paul to the Romans. Let's listen. A reading from the book of Genesis. Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Send everyone away from me. So no one stood with him. When Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of the Pharaoh heard it, Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land for these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me to preserve you, for you to remain on earth, and to keep alive for you and to keep you alive for many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to a Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler of all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to your father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Joseph and of Josen, and you shall be near me you and your children and your children's children as well as your flocks your herds and all that you may have i'll provide for you there since there are five more years of famine to come so that you and your households and all that you have will not come to poverty and now your eyes and the eyes of my brother benjamin see that it is my with my own mouth that i speak to you you must tell my father now how greatly i am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen hurry and bring my father down here then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck wept and wept while Benjamin wept upon his neck and kissed all his brothers and wept upon them and after that and after that his brothers talked with him the word of the Lord thanks be to God thanks be to God the psalm appointed for today is Psalm 133 Oh, how good and pleasant a thing it is when brethren live together in unity. It is like fine oil upon the head that runs down upon the beard upon the beard of Aaron, and runs down upon the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon, that falls upon the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has ordained the blessing, life forevermore. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now re 
but have not received mercy because of their disobedience. So they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may be merciful to all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Jesus called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my Heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon, but he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The Gospel of the Lord. 
Praise to you, Lord Christ. I'm very grateful to be here at All Saints Church in Worcester and grateful to Bernie Poppy for uh, doing this recording uh, in their courtyard on a beautiful July day. I know you won't hear these words till August, um, but it's a gorgeous day in, uh, in Worcester. And I'm here with uh, my old pal, Frank. Uh, that makes me feel pretty comfortable too. So some of you may know this, there are two different Old Testament tracts that are available to us during the summer months. And I know that some of you have not been reading from Genesis since Trinity Sunday. It's okay. You've missed a lot, but it's okay. I'm going to preach, though, today on Genesis 45, the first 15 verses, fairly confident that you know the story. It's about the reunion between Joseph and his brothers. You may remember that the sordid saga of Joseph and his brothers began back in the 37th chapter of Genesis. And there we saw Joseph as a 17-year-old spoiled brat. His most favorite thing in the world to do was to report back to daddy every time his shepherd brother screwed up. His brothers, therefore, are not particularly fond of him. In fact, the Bible uses a word that most of us who are parents forbade our children to use. The narrator says his brothers hated him. In fact, that they hated him enough to want to kill him. This is sibling rivalry on steroids. In the end, they settle for throwing him into a pit and selling him off to some foreign traders. This is bad stuff. So if you are on the track that has been reading Genesis since Trinity Sunday, you know that this is where we left Joseph last weekend sold to those Midianite traders for 20 pieces of silver. The brothers go home. They tell their father that a wild animal has killed their brother. And as evidence of Joseph's death in a world before DNA testing, they present Jacob, dad, with that amazing Technicolor dream coat smeared in animal blood. Jacob is a mess, as you can imagine, as any parent who loses a child would naturally be. Except that in this case, it's all a horrible lie. Joseph isn't dead. And so from there, the narrator takes us to Egypt, where Joseph has been sold to a man named Potiphar, a captain in Pharaoh's guard. And the two get along very well. The narrator tells us that Joseph was handsome and good-looking. To be honest, I'm not sure what the difference is between handsome and good-looking, but I think the narrator wants us to know in this redundancy that he is easy on the eyes. So I'm going to let you read up on your own on what happens from there. First of all, it's R-rated material, and this is a family show, but secondly, I was asked to keep this relatively brief today. What I do need to tell you is that Joseph does some time in prison, but then he gets out because he interprets a dream that Pharaoh has had that nobody else can interpret, a very strange dream about seven fat cows, seven skinny cows, about seven big ears of corn and seven scrawny little ears of corn. And nobody seems to be able to figure this out except for Joseph, the dreamer, and the dream interpreter. It comes easily to him, to be honest. But this particular dream is more about sound economic policy than it is an advanced course in Carl Jung. The dream means simply this, there are gonna be seven good economic years, good crops, a good growing economy, and then there are gonna be seven bad years, an economic downturn. And Joseph says simply this, if you're smart, Pharaoh, what you'll do is save up during the good years to be prepared for the lean years. And for this wisdom, he is promoted to become Secretary of Agriculture under Pharaoh. And he oversees that very process, and that's what they do. In the meantime, Jacob and sons have moved on with their lives as best they can, but they now have hit upon hard times because in Canaan, it's now the seven lean years, and nobody told them to save up during the seven fat years. And so Jacob sends his sons to Egypt to see if there is an economic stimulus package in the works coming out of Cairo. That brings us to where we are today. Joseph's brothers walk in, and they do not recognize who he is. Remember, he was a scrawny kid when they left him in that pit. 
and he is now a successful, powerful political appointee in the Egyptian cabinet. They simply do not recognize the man before them as their brother. But he knows who they are. If he has harbored bitter resentments toward them for all these years, this is his opportunity to get his pound of flesh. This is his opportunity to have them thrown into a dark pit and leave them for dead and see how they like it. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he weeps so loudly that Pharaoh's whole household hears him. And then he embraces his brothers. He forgives them. Can you imagine? Walter Brueggemann says that this story is about the challenge to live our lives between the hint of the dream and the doxology of disclosure. Between the hint of the dream and the doxology of disclosure. When someone suffers a trauma, as Joseph surely did, it is easy to understand how that person's nightmares would win out. How that person might be left embittered and blaming the world but if one is able to live between the hint of the dream and the doxology of disclosure, one sees that the story doesn't end in the pit. Joseph's story doesn't end there, but neither does his brother's story end there. There is more. Or as Andy Dufresne puts it in the Shawshank Redemption, you can get busy living or you can get busy dying. Joseph has gotten busy living and because of that, he has let go of the need to seek revenge on his brothers, or for that matter, to let them live rent-free in his head. He chooses to hug them, to embrace them, to forgive them. He wants to know how his father is doing. He chooses to get busy living. So I submit to you that this old story from the first book of the Torah, the first book of the Bible, is an Easter story because it is about redemption and it is about healing and it is about new life and it is just as importantly about trusting that God will be with us in the pits of life, in the prison cells of life, in the depths of our deepest fears and deepest pain, even to death on a cross on the outskirts of Jerusalem. We too live between the hint of the dream and the doxology of disclosure, as St. Paul did when he was sitting in a prison cell nearly 2,000 years ago, as he writes from that prison cell to the Christians in Philippi, I thank God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel. He writes that from prison. He, said he faced the same choice that Joseph faced, to get busy living or to get busy dying, and he chose to be alive. He chose to see God at work in his life and to live his life between the hint of the dream and toward the doxology of disclosure. We are invited to follow these good examples. And when we praise God, praising God, doxology always leads to love of neighbor, to reconciliation, even among those who have deeply hurt us. I think of Don Henley's words from the heart of the matter, which I will not sing to you today, but perhaps you know them and you can sing along. I have been trying to get down to the heart of the matter but my will gets weak and my thoughts seem to scatter. But I think it's about forgiveness. Forgiveness. And of course, I think of Eliza Hamilton when it's quiet uptown and she has been so hurt by Alexander's infidelity and so undone by the death of their son, Philip. And yet she too chooses to live between the hint of the dream and the doxology of disclosure. And it leads her as well to forgiveness. Can you imagine? And by God's grace, it happens in our lives from time to time as well. And when it does,
because it unleashes the power of God and it opens up grace upon grace and new possibilities. We need these old Bible stories to remind us to look at our lives and to invite us to live somewhere between the hint of the dream and the doxology of disclosure. So this is what I want to say to you today, my friends across this diocese of Western Massachusetts. Trusting the dream, the hint of the dream, makes doxology of disclosure possible. We act as best we can on the hints and guesses that lead us to risk healing and reconciliation. And that opens up for us again and again and again, opportunities to see the living God at work in our lives and in our world. All will be well. Praise God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise God, the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer, now and always. We speak aloud our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him, all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us open our hearts and minds, our lips now, in prayer to our God. With all our heart and all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the church, that we may find a way in this very moment to be for those around us a visible and active sign of God's faithfulness in hard times. Let us pray to the Lord. For authentic trust in God, that we may call out in faith with sincerity and conviction to God who saves and delivers us from all our suffering and need, let us pray to the Lord. For the Jewish people, whom God has irrevocably called, that they may experience the compassion and mercy of God more fully. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who have helped to strengthen our faith, for parents and teachers, for our Bishop Doug Fisher, for Presiding Bishop Michael Curry, and for Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, that they may continue to be examples of Christian discipleship to all who encounter them, let us pray to the Lord. For an end to racism and prejudice, that God will turn hearts and change minds so that everyone may be respected and their dignity affirmed, let us pray to the Lord. For all missing children, particularly those caught in human trafficking, that God will free them and reunite them with their families, let us pray to the Lord. For all parents, that God will inspire them and give them the patience to help their children learn and grow during the pandemic restrictions, 
let us pray to the Lord. For all who are sick, that God's healing love will strengthen them, remove their pain, and restore them to wholeness, let us pray to the Lord. For all who have died of COVID-19 and any other cause, that the God of life may gather them to himself in love, let us pray to the Lord. Ever-living God, whose will it is that all should come to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, inspire our witness to him that all may know the power of his forgiveness and the hope of his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, with hearts filled with longing for the Lord's Eucharistic presence in our lives, we pray the prayer of spiritual communion. Jesus, we believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. We love you above all things and desire to receive you into our souls. Since we cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into our hearts. We embrace you as if you were already there and unite ourselves wholly to you and in you to one another. Never permit us to be separated from you. Amen. And now our closing prayer. Let us pray with one voice. Almighty and ever living God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, hear our prayers for this parish family. Strengthen the faithful, arouse the careless, and restore the penitent. Grant us all things necessary for our common life and bring us all to be of one heart and mind within your holy church, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now the blessing. My friends, the Lord bless us and preserve us from all evil and keep us in eternal life. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks to all who prayed together this morning. Now we join in our closing hymn, Come Down, O Love Divine. And we'll see you then at our coffee hour. God bless you and thank you.
Thank you for joining in prayer this morning with the Church of St. Matthew, serving the heart of the Commonwealth since 1871. God bless you.